welcome to episode 237 of the Daily Fantasy Edge. My name is Adam Levitan. I am one of the analysts here at DraftKings. I am the father of the most beautiful beast in the world, Jerry. And we are coming off of a running back overload week. Yes, that's right. There were at least five really, really, really strong plays at the running back position. And really, that's been the case most weeks this season on DraftKings. But this week was unique because two of those five were really cheap. We had Jalen Samuels at 3,700. We had Jeff Wilson at 3,800, both with exceptional roles, I think, relative to salary. However, and this was really the question of the slate, do we take those values because passing on that kind of extreme bargain at the running back position is typically bad, or do we pass on one or, God forbid, both of those cheap guys because the running back position in today's NFL is so wild for a PPR format? You know, it's almost as if DraftKings pricing can't account for the roles of these running backs who are getting more targets than most wide receivers every week. You have McCaffrey and Barkley and Ezekiel Elliott, a near lock for three down plus goal line plus five to 10 targets every week. So yeah, Samuels and Wilson are great values and I almost never ever pass on spots like that. But these top end running back situations are so unique that passing on a 15 point floor and like a 50th percentile outcome in the 25 point range for McCaffrey, Barkley, and Zeke, that's likely wrong as well. And the outcome was pretty much as expected. It was what 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 is the most likely result when you do this, when you play two lineups, you have one good lineup and one bad lineup. You know, they're only 25 points apart, but there was a huge difference in results. And given the state of today's games and the rake, like you're really likely to break around even, lose a little when you play two cash lineups. And that's exactly what happened. Now, believe me, I know that it's possible to win with two different lineups, but I thought this week it was unlikely because of how different the construction was in the Wilson one versus the CMC one, you know, 5,500 difference in salary, not a clean 2v2 available. One thing I was really happy about this past week was my decision to just not play Keenan Allen at all, uh, not in cash, GPP or, or whatever, you know, regardless of result, I know he had a touchdown, um, but I knew he would be really popular. I knew he was a fine play. But talked about all week, talked about in three man, talked about in leverage, about why I didn't think he was a really good play at his price. So I saved the 1100 there and went T.Y. Hilton. And you can see the ceiling difference, right? Like one guy, Keenan Allen, is grinding out catches, you know, eight yards at a time with this pitifully low, you know, around the league's worst A dot with a league average yak, a league average yard after catch in a potential blowout. Meanwhile, T.Y. Hilton is just blowing the doors off, you know, huge plays everywhere in a condensed offense possible shootout. So I was really happy to stick with what I've been trying to concentrate on all season, which is to accentuate ceiling over simple floor plays, even in cash. And that's not to say that Keenan, you know, wasn't a fine play last week, or he won't be a great play going forward. I know he plays Thursday against uh, the Chiefs, but just this specific spot, I wanted to be off. And he was the most owned wide out on the slate in tournaments at 25%. And, you know, if you didn't, you know, buy the case for fading Keenan in cash, which I certainly think a lot of people um, couldn't buy, and I get that. I mean, if you couldn't fade Keenan in tournaments, uh, I think you were playing them pretty poorly. Speaking of wideouts and egregious ownership percentages, uh, I've thought a lot about wide receiver roles when a frontline player goes down, and I don't have the data. You know, I'd like to get to it maybe in the off season, but a lot of these secondary wideouts just aren't capable of filling the shoes left by the guys in front of them. Tyler Boyd is not capable of A.J. Green stuff. In in fact, he benefits massively from Green's presence. Kenny Galladay needs some help around him to draw attention. Cortland Sutton has absolutely no prayer of running the kind of routes that Manny Sanders runs, as we talked about on the three-man. Sterling Shepard can't do what Odell does. So do these guys really get role changes? In most instances, I'd say no, absolutely not. The best thing that we can say about these guys is Hopefully, they get a better target floor. But those targets threaten to be really inefficient, as we've seen with guys like Sutton and Galladay, etc. Boyd. So Sutton at 23%, the second most owned wide receiver on the slate. Sterling Shepard at 14%. You know, just no-brainer fades in tournaments. I'm even upset with myself for playing them in one of my cash teams, you know, the CMC team as a salary saver at wideout. Of course, you know, in hindsight, the only one actually getting 
a real role change in Denver was Deshaun Hamilton, you know, Penn State zone. And you can make a case for Tim Patrick too, but, you know, Hamilton was the one who would take Manny's slot routes where Keenum likes to throw. And Hamilton was a stone minimum. And he came in at lower ownership. So yeah, I think huge mistake by me there uh, in that CMC lineup, not playing Deshaun Hamilton. I think the spots where wide receivers can have a big impact is where a guy is blocked in terms of snaps and then he gets a new role. You know, not guys already playing a ton. So like Chris Godwin was only playing 40% of the snaps. He takes over for Deshaun Jackson. Dante Pettis taking over for Garcon or Godwin. You know, even like Robert Foster taking over for Kelvin Benjamin. I'm not looking for, uh, I'm looking for snap count changes for role changes. Um, not just, hey, you know, number one receiver's out, the number two wide receiver, it's time to go Yahtzee. You know, that's more of a thing in the NBA. You know, like I remember when Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan were playing together, every time one of them was out, the other one would just go absolutely ham. It's not like that for wide receivers in the NFL. And I think, you know, People just plug and play, and myself included, and it's just a really big mistake, especially in tournaments, but it's a really big mistake all around, I think. Let's get to the four-man, and woo boy, we are in trouble now. Uh, Thought I had Pacing Pete, the listener league winner, dead and buried, but he gets a late TD from Ben to Juju Smith-Schuster. He had both of them, and a late TD from Deshaun Hamilton. Nice play there to get the win. Uh, Pacing Pete actually went Samuel, Zeke, and Kamara at running back, and I know a lot of people liked... Kamara, I was still really shocked at how owned he was in both cash and GPP, you know, given how close he was in salary to Zeke and really how close he was to CMC and with Tampa Bay defense really turning things around since firing their defensive coordinator, you know, Kamara in a heavy, heavy timeshare with Ingram. I was shocked uh, how owned he was, but saving that money on Kamara allowed pacing Pete to get Juju in there, which obviously was a huge difference maker, 36 points for Juju against the Raiders. So uh, great job by Pacing Pete getting the win there. Nice team. Uh, Al went with Wilson, Zeke, Barkley, Kelsey. Got a ton of points there, but then he just got buried by his wide receivers, Sutton, Godwin, and Zay Jones. You know, total for the three of them, like 10 points. You know, so brutal. Like Even if you didn't like those guys as plays, that's still so, so, so far below expectation. Uh, Peter, of course, DFL yet again, he went Wilson and Samuels, but he didn't use that salary to get up to one of the big three running backs. He used saving with Wilson, with Jeff Wilson and Samuels to get up to Kamara. So he passed on all of Zeke, Barkley, Christian McCaffrey. Uh, I thought that's a pretty clear mistake, paid the price there. Uh, He had a ton of money for wide receiver once he went that way. But as I talked about uh, at the top of this show and and last week, you know, wide receiver is not where I want to spend a majority of my cap in today's NFL. Um, I want to spend it on these running backs who are essentially wide receivers and running backs in one with goal line roles. So you see what happens. You know, he played Keenan, Nuke, and Sutton, and he just gets punished. He's like, yeah, I have all this salary. I'm going to play Keenan and DeAndre Hopkins. It's great. Um, It's not great. It's it's nowhere near the floor-ceiling combo, even if you have to pay a little bit more of CMC, Zeke, Barkley types, Gurley types, et cetera. Anyways, the updated standings now, good Lord. The listeners have five wins. I myself have five wins. Al has three wins. Peter has one win. We got to step it up. Major pressure last three weeks here. Listener League Week 14 was once again 10,000 entries, creating a massive 50K rake-free prize pool. Uh, Filled a bit later, around 10.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. So the Week 15 Listener League is again 10K entries. It has already been posted. It is still by far, by far the best tournament on DraftKings. Rake free, $5 buy-in, 3 entry max, flat payouts, 24% of the field at least doubles their money. You know, of course, the field is a little bit sharper than a standard DK field. You know, I see some sharp differences in ownership percentages each, each week in the Listener League versus the main field stuff, but still, I think that's more than mitigated by the structure of the tournament. So don't embarrass us by letting this thing overlay. You go to DK Playbook, either on mobile or on desktop. You either go to the drop down to find the landing page on mobile or on desktop, you find the logo for this podcast. Once you get to the landing page, you will find the link. Really not that hard. You can also just Google to find the landing page. It should work. The Week 14 Listener League went to R. Cullinan, and I believe, I believe our Cullinan 
is a repeat winner. It looks like his Twitter is locked, so I couldn't see if he was tweeting at me that he won twice, or but I, I'm almost certain that he won before. Um, if so, an unreal accomplishment to win this thing twice. And his lineup was clearly well thought out. You know, he wasn't just mashing buttons. He got Dak Prescott 1.8%, Amari Cooper 6.9%, Ezekiel Elliott 38%, brought it back with Zach Ertz at 8%. I mean, we know the Philadelphia secondary is among the least talented in the NFL right now. You know, we know their pass rush is a shell of itself. And we know Amari is capable of having some truly epic games and he's seen it in Dallas. So, you know, really like that stack at a low ownership. Obviously in hindsight, I really like that stack. Um, wish I liked it more before the slate started. Uh, Art Cullinan went Samuels. I did play Keenan, but went Deshaun at 12% over Sutton. And then the key was Kittle. You know, he ran a two tight end set. He had Ertz. He had Kittle at 4%. We, we knew Kittle's ownership was going to be real low considering how close in price he was to Ebron, Gronk, you know, Ertz and Kelsey. And like Kittle's ceiling is just as high as those guys. So a lot of times when we pivot to guys, we say, oh, this guy's a great play. He's going to be 3% owned. He's going to be 4% owned. That's because he has absolutely no ceiling or he doesn't have the same ceiling as the guys around him in price at the same position. But George Kittle, I mean, certainly ceiling is massive. We've seen it all throughout the year. And lastly, defense for our Cullinan. Uh, he played the Lions at Arizona at 1.6%. I mean, if you just played the defense facing Arizona all year, it's just a, a print fest, just a total print fest. And at 1%, it's always going to be profitable to do that blindly. Like Josh Rosen in this offense is just incapable. In second place was Sean BR85. I, I think you could have seen this as a cash lineup. If you thought Dak was good enough, or maybe it was his cash lineup and he just changed the quarterback to Dak to make it work, but he had Dak, Zeke, Amari, Samuels, Barkley, Godwin, Sterling Shepard, Gronk, you know, Giants D, Yahtzee, you know, very cash-esque lineup, I guess, except for Dak and Amari. So nice job there by Sean BR85 to tweak it a little bit. Uh, in third place was Hess14, Lamar Jackson naked, obviously, at 2%. Austin Eckler, 4.4%. I thought this was sharp, you know, like the coach speak coming out of LA was that they were going to mix in Justin Jackson a ton. I mean, it was hard for me to buy completely considering how efficient Austin Eckler has been, how good he's been playing behind Melvin Gordon for the last couple of years. Um, and I think if Austin Eckler didn't get hurt, I believe he suffered a concussion or aggravated a stinger. Maybe he would have played even more, but you know, 4% Austin Eckler, I thought was sharp. Barkley and Samuels, T.Y. Hilton, Amari, Gronk. What a game for Hilton and Amari. I mean, geez, unbelievable. Congrats to Hess on his third place finish. But the star, of course, is R. Cullinan. We will see you in the week 15 four-man. Uh, it's scary. If listeners get a win here, they take the season lead. All right. Now it is time for everyone's favorite portion of the program. Producer Luke hit the theme music. Thanks as always to everyone for the questions. Going to hit a 10 pack today. Question one comes from Robert Slockett. He says, how involved is your wife when it comes to DFS wins slash losses? Is it rough after a losing week? Uh, good question. I actually think this is important, you know, not just for wives, but really anyone in your life. I, I think it's really worth at least trying to explain this to them. Um, every time I play, I'm winning money, not literal money, not actual money, be because believe me, I lose all the time. You know, I lose a ton, have awful weeks, have awful days. I'm always losing actual money. But in terms of expected value or money in the more theoretical sense, I'm winning literally every time I play. And I know that's a tough thing for a lot of people to grasp. You know, Adam, you lost 10K today. How in the hell can you say you won money? It makes no sense. Well, if I have an edge on the field, no matter how small, every time I play, I'm winning theoretical money. You know, that's why like I just can't face blackjack or craps or, you know, betting NFL closing lines at minus 110 or anything else like that. I know I have a negative expectation. Every time I play that, I'm losing money, even if I win. Right. So, like, oh, it'll be fun. You know, we'll go play craps. We'll go play blackjack. It sounds so fun. Uh, it's not fun to me. I have a sick feeling in my stomach, even if I'm winning, because I know I'm just giving them money. 
theoretical money. Now, there are two huge points here. First, and maybe most importantly, we cannot overestimate our own abilities. We cannot lie to ourselves. The only way we can say we are plus EV is by tracking results and having a large sample. You know, we can't just be saying, uh, hey, I know fantasy football. You know, I lost, but I just got unlucky. No, no, no. We, we can't do that. We need to track the results and have it proven over time. Also, we need to understand, you know, like bet sizing and your role. You can't just punt off the mortgage money and then be like, well, you know, you see, honey, we actually can pay the mortgage with this theoretical money I won just by playing, even though I lost. No, 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 that, that can't work either. Now, also, we should note that this can change, right? Like your expectation, whether you are actually winning every time you play or not, this can change. You know, maybe the game has passed you by. Maybe you're not working hard enough anymore. Maybe you are only plus EV against certain opponents and not others. And that's fluid. You know, maybe you're plus EV in certain rake amounts and not others. So a lot goes into it, right? Like you have to be constantly making sure you're still a favorite. So yeah, I know it's a long answer, uh, Robert, but really, uh, honestly, going back to the original question, uh, the key, I think, is to have an amazing, smart, trusting wife who gets it, right? Like she knows it doesn't matter if I win a bunch today or lose a bunch today. Like it, it's irrelevant. She understands it's completely irrelevant. We don't even talk about it. So yeah, I, I hope that helps. Uh, important point, I think. Uh, question two comes from Dole Miles. He says, are you ever going to change your Twitter avatar? Uh, are you insane, Dole Miles? Uh, in that pic, I have reasonable skin. I have reasonable hair. Uh, yeah, it's from roughly a decade ago, but there's no shot I'm changing that to some version of my disgusting current self. Uh, I mean, I'm 36 now. I think I can hang on to that profile pic until I'm at least, I don't know, like 60 or so. I also think there's some branding element to staying consistent with your profile picture. People are like so accustomed to seeing that. Uh, they're comforted by it. They love to see it. A change would be a mistake, I think. Question three comes from DeKalb Militia. He says, hi, Adam. Great work so far this year. I've always been curious about the percentage of your yearly income that comes from DFS and what percent comes from other areas such as labs, DK playbook, etc. Don't want to know hashtag how rich, but more just curious about the percent breakdown. Thanks. Yeah, I wasn't going to answer this, but I got this question a bunch over the last month or so. Not really sure why. Um, I'm not going to get into details, but but I'll just say this. Uh, my main focus right now is on the business stuff, not playing. You know, like if my focus was on playing, then I'd be playing every sport, every slate, you know, I'd be playing constantly through overlap session. And that's just not my priority right now, right? My priority is being on Team Smell the Roses. My priority is the business side of things. And by the way, when I say the business side of things, I don't mean just like writing articles and doing the podcast or whatever. I mean like starting businesses in the space that I think can help people, that can generate passive income, um, that can be acquired, stuff like that, stuff that has a real ceiling you know, like a way, 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 way higher ceiling than you could ever generate or I could ever generate uh, just playing. So if that answers your question without uh, directly answering it, um, to call but militia. Question four comes from Jake Mason. He says, do you ever see DraftKings having the ability to allow chopping in a tournament like people do in poker tournaments or would it just be too complicated? Yeah, it's an interesting thought, but I don't think it's it's possible, Jake. I mean, no one is ever dead in DFS, right? It's not like a poker tournament where people are bust, though. They're out. You know, you could have been in 500th place on Sunday with only like Eagles, Cowboys still going on. But if you had Dak, Cooper, Zeke, Ertz, you know, Aguilar, whatever, you were still alive. So there's no way DraftKings could let people chop. There's just, you know, too many outcomes we can't even see. We can't even rule out. Question eight comes from a great friend of the show, one of the best friends of the show, Adam Brown, uh, one of my partners in the super contest, along with ETR, Eric Snyder. Uh, by the way, we're currently in 87th uh, out of 3,047 entries in the super contest this year. It's like 1.4 million to first. We need a miracle from God over the last three weeks, you know, please one time. But yeah, anyway, uh, Adam Brown, best real estate agent in Philly. You know, what can Brown do for you? Find him. Anyways. He asks, I recently adopted a puppy that is rocking my world. Is paying someone else to train the dog cheating the parent-dog relationship? What's the play? 
Uh, well, first of all, hashtag how rich. But second of all, I, I mean, if you came here looking for someone to tell you not to pay someone to do something for you, uh, you've come to the wrong place, my friend. Uh, of course, it's fine to pay a trainer, right? This is their job. They know what they're doing. It'll be beneficial, I think, for both you and the dog. I think it's typically better to be there while the trainer is doing the training because like if you don't keep up with it when the trainer is gone, it's just irrelevant. It's just like you have to keep up with it. The, the guy is, the trainer is giving you a plan uh, to keep up with. Um, you have to stick with his methods. But yeah, I don't think that this will damage the parent-dog relationship. Those beasts know what's up. They're, they're so loyal. Um, but yeah, man, like we haven't talked about this too much this year, but regular listeners know my take on this on this general stuff, you know, if you're going to be on Team Smell the Roses, you have to value your time appropriately. You know, should I spend the next two hours doing my laundry or could I make better use of that time by paying someone else to do it and then spending that time being productive with work or, you know, playing with the kids or whatever? You know, it's a no-brainer for me. The only thing, you know, we we can't buy or we can't buy directly is time. Um, but indirectly, I can buy time all the time, constantly. Question nine comes from Andrew Vital. He says, you often talk about how the money line is lower as buy-ins get lower. Then why don't you just play all $1 head-to-heads and 50-50s? What's the incentive of playing high stakes? Couldn't you just play more super low stakes to increase the win percentage? So for those of you guys that don't know, people are capped at 50 games. Everyone's capped at at 50 games, the low buy-in levels on DraftKings. I think it's $10 and below, but not positive on that. But anyways, it is if I play $35 head-to-heads and 10 $5 three-mans and 10 $5 ten-mans, then that's it. Uh, I can't play anymore at the $5 level. The, the system won't let me on drafting. So there's that. Uh, also, to answer Andrew's question more accurately without sounding like a total douche, I mean, uh, I need action, man. Like, uh, it's almost impossible to get in play what I want to get in play without playing some higher stakes. So you know, I'm still trying to get in good games. I'm still trying to practice the best game selection out of anybody on the site. But but yeah, like, there's no way around it. That is going to do it for another edition of the Solo Pod. We'll be back on Thursday night for the three-man game-by-game breakdown with Al and Pete. For Jerry, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody. We are promoters at DraftKings and also avid fans. Our usernames are Adam Levitan, Al Smizzle, and CSURAM88. We may sometimes play on our personal accounts in the games that we offer advice on. Although we have expressed our personal view on the games and strategies in this podcast, they do not necessarily reflect the views of DraftKings, and we also may deploy different players and strategies than what we recommended in this podcast.